Private finances for anything. In business for over 32 years, Magic Finances is dedicated to customer satisfaction. If you've got credit issues, they have the answer. No matter what your profile is, they can help. They work with people on fair credit, bad, or simply terrible credit repayment history, as well as people who have no money down. That's right, no money down. They are located at 6385 North Federal Boulevard with great auto inventory. Give them a call at 303-298-1155. That's Magic Finances, features marbles in the district. They're open Monday through Friday till 8 and Saturdays till 7. Check them out. That's Magic Finances. Call them today at 303-298-1155. Tell them that you heard about it here at KVHSDenver.com. Also, visit us at www.magicfinances.com. Good afternoon and welcome to the council. I'm your host, Charlie Pacello. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for tuning into the council today. We are very excited to have the guests that we have on today. I can't tell you how excited I am to have them on. I, we, we met in a most uh, auspicious way, and uh, being that the council here is dedicated to helping people heal from trauma and depression and being able to give people the tools and the resources available out there to help you to understand that you have people that can make a difference in your life and to, that you don't have to carry this all alone and that there are people out there who are ready and able to support you. That's what the council is all about. So thank you so much for tuning in today. We are broadcasting live here in beautiful Denver, Colorado. I mean, it is just a gorgeous, a kind of hot day, but it's still gorgeous. And uh, we are uh, broadcasting here in North Glen and all across the beautiful city of Denver and Fort Collins, Colorado Springs, and all across this great nation and all around the world. Uh, we are being listened to by so many people from so many different continents and wherever you're tuning in, whether it's the Philippines or India or uh, Europe or South America, we thank you so much for tuning in here to the council. Every uh, couple weeks, we try to give you the best shows that we possibly can to get you the information you need to be able to make your life the best it can possibly be. And I also want to thank our sponsor, which is magicfinancing.com. Magic Financing, if you need a car, a used car, a new car, boy, go check out Mago the Magician. He's an old friend, a family friend of ours, and he will take care of you. He'll get you a new car, a used car. Um, he'll get you your dream car. Go check them out at magicfinancing.com. Ask for Mago the Magician and just tell him that Charlie sent you. Uh, he'll know who it is. Um, anyway. Folks, I had an incredible experience this week to, to work on a retreat or this past week, uh, helping veterans heal uh, over at the Fish Creek Ranch in Montana. Uh, it was one of the most incredible honors that I've ever had the opportunity to do. Um, we had some incredible men. You would be so proud of the men that were in this group and, and those who served and uh, how they were now able to do this deep healing and soul work and mix it with activities that help them to move through it and <clears throat> uh, to watch the, the, the movement from collapsing into the wound to moving where they can carry it with dignity and, and strength uh, was just incredible um, and I just felt so blessed to be able to to move the work forward and uh, you know and today it's what we're, we're, we're kind of going that doing that same thing we're uh, informing people about another organization that is carrying out the mission, helping veterans to find the resources that they need so that they can, so that they can, you know, live and, and heal and recover and being able to find what, where they can, you know, find how to get a, to a home or how they can get the, a job or anything that can give them the things that will give them the important, consistent care that they need. It's amazing. These people, the, both the men and women, they were willing to go out into danger for people that they don't even know and willing to sacrifice and give their lives for it. And, you know, it's our social contract. One of the things that we want to do is repair that social contract because we owe it to them, because they, they are willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, and we need to do our best to give them the resources they need that are available out there that very often they can't find because they just don't know of the organizations that are out there to help them. Well, one of the organizations is Code of Support Foundation. 
It is an amazing organization, and we are very fortunate and very lucky to have Christina Kaufman, Christy Kaufman, who is the Chief Executive Officer <clears throat> and co-founder of the Code of Support Foundation. During her 11 years as a wartime Army wife, Christy experienced firsthand the numerous barriers between those who served and the resources designed to support them and their families. Christy co-founded Code of Support with Vietnam veteran General Alan Salisbury to remove these barriers and make good on our promise as a nation to honor and care for those who have served our country. And Alan Salisbury, Major General, retired General Salisbury, is the co-founder and chairman emeritus of the Code of Support Foundation. He completed a 30-year career in the U.S. Army with his final assignment as the Commanding General of the U.S. Army Information Systems Engineering Command. He spent 12 years in industry in R&D assignments with Contel Corporation, President Contel Technology Center, and the Microelectronics and Computer Technology Corporation, uh, and then headed U.S. operations for Learning Tree International, Chairman and President. He has sat on numerous corporate, corporate boards, including four public companies, several nonprofit boards, and has many professional associations. He is a graduate of West Point and holds an MS and PhD from Stanford University. Their website is www.codeofsupport.org. That's C O D E O F S U P P O R T dot O R G. Welcome, Christy and Alan. Thanks, Charlie. We're happy to be here. <laughs> it's an honor to have you both. I really am just, uh, my gosh, I. I just love the work that you do, and I, I would love for you, each of you, to just take a moment to share a little bit more about your background, and, uh, and for you, Alan, uh, just why you chose the military, and then for Christy, if you could just share a little bit about your early influences and education, and how they help you in your work that you're doing today. Great. Alan, age before beauty. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go first then. <laughs> okay. Um, how I chose the military is too long a story to tell here because it, it, it is actually a convoluted story. A bit. But uh, it basically, it was that my dad married the widow, this was the second marriage, of a West Point graduate who had a son who always wanted to follow in his father's footsteps. And I tagged along for the ride, I guess. Not knowing what I was getting into, not knowing much about the military, having a pretty good idea I was going to get a good education. And I only had a three-year commitment to, to fulfill after uh, graduating from West Point. And I figured that would be easy and I could go on and do the rest of my life. Well, I found I enjoyed the work I was doing and more than enjoying the work, I loved the people that I was working with. And that's what kept me in for what turned out to be just about 30 years of military service. Wow. Well, I agree with you there, sir. They're the, the people make that making working in the service such a special thing, really extraordinary. Christy? Yeah, so I grew up in New Rochelle, New York. I was a, a competitive gymnast, got a, sol a scholarship out to the University of California in Berkeley, and really had nothing on my radar around military or veteran stuff. And then I had the great timing of marrying a soldier, um, right before 9-11, like Alan, he went to West Point. So you can imagine West Point and Berkeley coming together, that was pretty <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> I always say the only place those right. two worlds could possibly collide is we met in Vegas, that's how that happened. <laughs> and so I went from Berkeley, California to Lawton, Oklahoma, which was a culture shock for me and for Oklahoma. And uh, then a couple months after we got married, the war started, uh, and so that kind of thrust me into you know, the the world that uh, that I learned to I learned to live in. Yeah, well, I, and I when you said that about West Point and and Berkeley, I'm a, a, some many of the people who listen to the show know I'm a graduate of the Air Force Academy, and so I, I've I've had those dynamics where worlds are clashing and coming together. But sometimes it can really work, and I think that it can influence us in a way that's really helpful uh, when we're doing work like you guys are doing with Code of Support. Alan, I'd like to ask a question about your service. Um, what was the most profound 
or intense moment you had while you were in the military. Is there a memory that stands out above the rest? Well, I probably would, would give you two quick examples of that. Uh, first thing uh, was when I arrived at, at, at my first assignment, which uh, for me was at Fort George G. Meade, Maryland. Uh, and I was assigned to the 69th Signal Battalion, and I was a platoon leader. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you get a lot of, of summer training and classroom training and academic views of what you're going to be doing on leading soldiers. And, and the, when you finally meet the first soldiers, and, and it was about 45, I think, in that, that first platoon that I had, you realize that these guys, if we go to war, are dependent on you. And all of a sudden, uh, in the words of Simone Biles, the, the, the weight of the world felt like it was on my shoulders. That was a pretty p profound recognition that, okay, now we're, we're doing this for real. It's not an academic subject anymore. Mm -hmm. The second uh, point was, was 10 years into, into my career. And uh, I graduated in 1958, 10 years into my career is the summer of 1968, which was a pretty restless time in this country, as you should remember. Um, and uh, that was when I found myself on an airplane descending into uh, Saigon in uh, Korea, or in Vietnam. And uh, there I was on, on the way to uh, the real adventure of my life. Now I say that because I was a communicator, not an infantry guy, not an artillery guy, not a tank guy. Uh, and, but I, I respected those people so much. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I showed up there and when I came back from that year, uh, I, I had lots of experiences in, in the, during that year that not, were not direct combat for me, mm -hmm. but uh, working with the soldiers that were in direct combat and whatnot, but it was the moment of getting off the airplane back in the United States and realizing these people outside the airport are there to really throw stones at me verbally or if not physically. They blamed the war on those who fought it. And that was a profound recognition of no good deed sometimes goes unpunished. But it also stayed with me that we have to educate the American public much more as to why the soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, and Coast Guardsmen, et cetera, put on the uniform and protect and pre defend the Constitution of the United States. Uh, they do that and they do what they're asked to do by their country. And the American people need to appreciate that and understand it, unlike so many other countries where the military might have a mind of its own. And that's very true. And as the son of a Vietnam veteran, I take it very, you know, <clears throat> what happened to the, uh, the soldiers and the airmen and the, air, uh, the sailors and the, the, all those, the Marines that uh, fought in that, con that war, what happened to them when they came back was, uh, was disgraceful. And uh, because uh, whether you agreed with the, the war or not, those men and women, they fight for a different cause. They fight for something bigger than themselves. They fight for their country and the Constitution. And it's uh, that w they're going out to do what their country asked them to do. Uh, you've got to support them. You've got to take care of them. You've got to understand that they're willing to sacrifice their life for you, whether they like you or not, so that you can continue to protest. You can continue to do those exactly. things. For that, they give they give you that privilege, and it's a privilege. And so, you're so right, sir. And we we needed to be able to educate the popul the population more, and to repair that social contract that was broken. I believe during that during that conflict, Christy, um, it's amazing your story. Uh, I was able to listen to it uh, on a podcast that you and Alan just recently did. And I would love for you to be able to share with us how you came to be a part of the military family. I mean, it's just so fascinating. And you didn't really know much about it until you got married into it. Um, what were some of the challenges that you faced moving from the civilian world to the Army life? And what stands out that most people don't realize? 
it, not knowing much about it means like I knew nothing. Yeah, I knew nothing about it. <laughs> uh, you know, that's what happens when you meet your husband in Vegas. Um, before we were married, he was stationed in like Germany, Hawaii, Vegas. And I thought to myself, well, those all sound like good places. And didn't, you know, he's combat arms and, and didn't realize that most of those places aren't. Um, you know, that's a not normal place for a guy like that to be stationed. So when I when he told me we were after we got married that we we're going to Lawton, Oklahoma, I seriously thought it was an island in Hawaii for a couple minutes. <laughs> like, no, no, it's not an island. Version, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I mean, um, I I think that uh, you know I I just looked at it as kind of an adventure. We got married again right before nine eleven, and so that um, that quickly transitioned to kind of oh oh man we we. We've got something to deal with, you know, that that uh, I don't think the army was really equipped for. Mm -hmm. I mean, we our last war was, um, you know, the, uh, the Gulf War in the early 90s. And so um, I think that the, the deployments that started, you know, pretty much a couple of years later and the operational tempo and um, kind of living with that uh, and, and trying to support the, the, sol the soldiers and families in his unit became kind of an all-encompassing thing for me. And, mm -hmm. you know, I graduated from college. I was going to uh, grad school at OU at the time. But I kind of set some of that aside because I just felt like the Army wasn't going to step up and do the things that needed to be done. And so I felt like I had to step in and try to do as much as I could. And so that was my quote unquote job for the next seven, eight years. And then he did his battalion command at Fort Bragg from 06 to 08 during the surge. Uh, and and so it was, it was a lot. I, I think what I realized quickly, not coming from that background and not really knowing anybody from that, that um, life was that the people are amazing, right? Mm -hmm. So just, we had girls in our unit that, you know, had five kids and was volunteering and working and it's just it's the, the family members I mean, we talk about the soldiers and, and the service members a lot but none of that can happen without the family members and so i was i was always super impressed by the, uh, the wherewithal and the resiliency of the families but everybody has got a breaking point and i think at some point um you know maybe after a third fourth deployment um, things start to get really rough, and that's what we were seeing down at Fort Bragg. Um, and I and I, I tried my best to kind of try to help the families, but also address some of the systemic problems that that really couldn't be solved at the installation level. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, being the Berkeley girl that I am, tried to change the entire army, and it turns out <laughs> they really love when wives do that. Yeah, they do. So and Reese in all kinds of trouble. Um, and so yeah, it, it was it was it was a rough period. It was also a beautiful period for a lot of, of different reasons for people coming together. But we just, Alan says this all the time that we decided as a country to outsource our national defense to less than one percent of the population for almost twenty years, mm -hmm. and there's a price to pay for that. And we were seeing it on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we when we moved up here. In 2008, I ended up writing an op-ed that was published in the Washington Post to kind of address some of these bigger systemic issues that I wasn't really getting anywhere with down at um, post level. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what kind of really led to me meeting Alan and then us starting Go to Support Foundation. Well, that was pretty, uh, I mean, you ruffled a lot of feathers with that article. I know, I read it, it was, it was right on point. And I know there was, you know, sometimes uh, these things, uh, you know, when you run up the chain of command and if you're not doing that, uh, you know, in the military, you're not familiar with that, and you write an op-ed piece like you wrote there, which was uh, you exposed something that really needed to be addressed. How was that? Uh, how was that? You know, how did you deal with that? What was the response? Um, did it cause uh, some problems that uh, that uh, you needed to deal with at that time? Yes. Yeah, so. You know, I, I was I was raised to the family too much is given, much is expected. So I really felt morally obligated to write it. I just felt so frustrated that there were these things that needed to happen and I couldn't change them from the position I was in. And so I really wrote it for, out of a moral obligation. I didn't really know what the impact was gonna be. And Reese, uh, my former husband, was up for his 06 board when it published. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing to risk your own reputation it's quite another to risk 
you know, your, your loved ones. And so we have a conversation about what that might look like, but we both decided that it was in the best interest of soldiers and families to go ahead with it. So then when it ran, um, I kind of ducked, to be honest with you, because I was getting, I mean, my third email was from the White House and the wow. Secretary of Defense and Congress, and, you know, people were just, you know, grabbing at me, and, and I knew enough to know I didn't know enough. Mm -hmm. I was right about what I said, and if you read that op-ed, Army Families Under Fire, it stands. I mean, we are still literally baking cookie, cookies and selling to our own husbands in the motor pool. Like, that's still happening to support family um, families and mental health. And so, you know, I, I think that it was spot on, but I really didn't understand the, the larger ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, so that's when I really put my head down to, to, to learn. Um, you know, my husband and I ended up getting a divorce, but it wasn't because of that article. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was getting asked that question a bunch when I was doing media, like did these, did this, these wars cause your, you know, the dissolution of your marriage? And I answered that as honestly as I can, which is I have no other perspective of my marriage than war. Mm -hmm. Like as soon as we got married, there was a war. And so more importantly, there's a whole generation of families that have that experience. You have children that don't know what life is without their parent deploying, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, you know, it, it, it was, as I said, the operational tempo over the past 20 years, particularly the, the time that, you know, I was active was, um, it was hard. Mm -hmm. It was, it was hard. Yeah. Well, it puts you, and, and serving as a commander's wife, I know that I'm sure that puts you in a pretty tough, difficult position because you're having to, you know, you're a thousand families that you're having to look after and, uh, and who's uh, struggling with finances and who's struggling with mental health issues and all these things. Could you describe some more of what these issues that you were discovering and what did it reveal to you about the systemic institutional changes that needed to be made? Yeah, I, I think that, first of all, shout out to the chaplains. Um, I'm not a particularly religious person, but those chaplains stepped up and what they were doing had really nothing to do with the, probably what they were trained for because they were basically our social workers, right? So we worked really closely with the chaplains um, on some of these kind of social issues that needed to be addressed. I think one of the things that we don't talk a lot about, or certainly we didn't back then, was the mental health impact on families, uh, children especially. So we had spouses that were attempting suicide. We had kids that were going off the rails. It was a you know a nine month wait to get the kid into any kind of specialized therapy. So the lack of kind of social support and mental health support for the family members is what I saw the most of because. You know, we were on rotating, um, uh, we were rotating batteries into, into Afghanistan at the time. So in one battalion, we saw the impact on families when they were about to go, when they were gone, and when they came back all at once. And I was, you know, I was kind of in charge, quote unquote, because I was married to this guy, which is not a great model to begin with. And I had four volunteers in their 20s and no money. Like that's never going to work. Okay? No, and so work. when it, when when I would challenge, you know, the generals and say, this is not a sustainable model, really the pushback was, well, figure it out. Or you all have much more than we ever had, which is absolutely true. The amount of programs and money that they were spending was was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. But just because you're spending money and creating programs doesn't mean they're actually having an impact. Right? So and I think that was the that was the challenge is that you can't you can't call it a win just because you spent money on it. Mm -hmm. All I know is you you hired 18 more people at Army Community Services, and I still can't get this down at the unit level. You know, I can't get enough money to pay for pizza so we can actually get families to come out. Mm -hmm. You know, and so then we can get the, the the military family life consultants and all the resources we had to them because at that point, three or four deployments in, nobody was coming out anymore. Right, they were they had heard everything before. The only way you could get them out was if you provided something social, like pizza or bowling or something for the kids. And I couldn't get that. Right, I couldn't get any coverage for that. So of course, like most command couples, we spend a lot of our own money during that time. Mm -hmm. Well, and and you're running into this, and you're seeing what needs to be changed. And then at the same time, sir, General Allen, you are you and a bunch of general officers had this idea of, of it was a preliminary idea about what code of support was going to focus on 10 years ago. So the idea was already germinating inside of you. Could you share with us what that was and, and how it changed and evolved 
when you when you met Christy? Sure. Uh, first off, the uh, code of support itself grew out of a, uh, in many ways, a, a newspaper spread in the Washington Post about less than optimum care going on at Walter Reed. And I don't mean medical care. I mean the, the general well-being surrounded some of the some of the soldiers that were there for quite a while as wounded warriors and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, and this luncheon group that, that uh, actually I've had for about 15 years now uh, with 15, 20 uh, friends that uh, just get together, uh, not to uh, tell old war stories, but we, we, we dubbed it informally as the Critical Issues Roundtable because we like to discuss uh, really interesting <laughs> topics of import. We've had some impact with writing op-eds and things like that. But we, we started talking about, do these kids need a Bill of Rights or something like that mm -hmm. to make sure that they get the, uh, the kind of support that they need? Well, that morphed into a bigger subject. And it's already been mentioned that fewer than 1% of, of Americans today wear the uniform and carry the burden of defending our country. Uh, the other 99% essentially, I'm going to use these words deliberately, get a free ride. Uh, and we asked ourselves, uh, what do that 99% owe these less than 1% in, in return? Well, they have a code of conduct that they are bound by ever since the Eisenhower administration. A set of six articles that d d dictates a lot of the things that uh, govern their lives for day to day, and a lot of it has to do with if they become prisoners of war, et cetera. But in the very first article of the Code of Conduct, it says, I am prepared to give my life in defense of my country. A very profound commitment. And that's what we said, how do you answer that? Well, Code of Conduct for less than 1%, we said maybe we should create a code of support for the other 99%. You, you've mentioned a couple of times this social contract. Mm -hmm. In effect, that's putting words into a social contract. And it creates six articles that tells Americans material things that they can do uh, to support the troops uh, and make themselves feel like they are really contributing to our national defense through creating this support network uh, for our troops. So the idea was, uh, we have these six articles that we created, uh, we put them up on the web, and that was kind of the end of it. Mm -hmm. we, we put it on the web, not to, we didn't create a foundation or anything like that. Uh, we just wanted Americans to see this, well about 500 came on and actually not only read it, but endorsed it. Mm -hmm. And the endorsements were very moving. You know, my grandfather was a World War I veteran, or my father was a World War II veteran, I dedicate my signing this pledge to the American people and to the troops and military families, I dedicate that to this hero of, of mine, et cetera. Uh, we moved on. Uh, 10 years, uh, well, it wasn't 10 years later, but maybe five years later, I found this document in uh, one day going through some of my papers, the Code of Support, forward uh, another year or so, uh, and th this was a very low-level foundation. It was me and a couple of uh, friends who uh, we, I created a little board for it, but with the, with the idea of promoting the code of support. One of my classmates uh, has a daughter who we've become, my family and I have become very close to as well, who happened to be a friend of a lady called Christina Kaufman. Mm -hmm. And she said, Alan, you really need to meet Christy because I think you have some common interests. So we met uh, on a blind date for lunch, if you want to call it that, uh, and talked over things. And this was now the Vietnam generation, knowing how we screwed up taking care of our veterans as they came home from that war, meeting the 9-11 generation and somebody who was intimately familiar with the need of today's troops and, and military families. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, uh, we hit it off. It wasn't Las Vegas. It was. Uh, Alexandria, Virginia, but the commonality of thought was there, uh, and I asked Chris, Christy to come on board, and Code of Support Foundation took on a whole new meaning. 
Um, and I'll let Christy tell you if you want to go on as to how we evolved into some of the new uh, aspects of the work that we were going to do beyond promoting uh, the code of support. And it grew out of a commitment that we made, I believe, that day that uh, we were not going to let what happened to my generation happen to her generation. Uh, and it, in, in particular, that we would we did not want to be just one more nonprofit on this spectrum of something like 40,000 were rumored to have troops and military families in their uh, mission statements. We didn't want to be 40,000 in one. Yeah. We wanted to find a unique role that could have more impact than that fractional addition. Christine. And I think you've done that in, in remarkably well, sir. And it's just, you know, I love that code of, co code of support. And, you know, I, I, having worked with veterans and, and many people for, for, for almost 10 years now with PTSD and trauma, one of the things that is at the root of that is the broken social contract. Coming in, they don't have that connection. They don't feel like they're part of the si society. They've changed, but the society hasn't changed. And if the society is not doing their part in order to hear their stories, welcome them back, taking care of them, whether there's medical or mental health issues that they need, taking care of their families, they feel like they have been uh, deserted and abandoned and, and betrayed. And so I just love that, that code of support. And I want to be able to get into it, like the details, because I think it's so important for people to actually say it and just to know what it is and to sign on it, because that is absolutely what is part and parcel of what is missing in the dialogue. Because I remember taking that code of uh, conduct uh, <laughs> when I swore in and I said I would I'd be willing to give my life up for our liberties and our freedoms. We do need a code of support from the society as well. Um, and yes, you uh, and, and Christy, you guys had, what did you notice about the nonprofits that were struggling and what did you conclude? And also, your mission on the website is this. It's they stood for us, we stand for them. How does code of support fulfill this mission? Yeah, so I wanted to point out that Alan's generation, when they came home, just didn't have anything. I mean, the, the, there was just so little out there to address the challenges that veterans can have when they're coming home and their families. My generation, as, uh, as Alan said, you know, has tens of thousands of nonprofits. We have DODVA state things. So it's not an issue for the most part of not having enough support. The problem is that it's almost impossible to navigate through it. So whether or not there's nothing out there or there's so much you can't get to it, the end state's the same, people don't get what they need. Mm -hmm. So that's what we really took on as a mission is that there had to be one nonprofit that's only job was really to integrate effort, to pull things together. You know, and that's really what was the, the, the mission from the very beginning is how do we take someone who's in crisis, whether that's an active duty, a veteran, could be from any generation, a family member, break down what's going on, actually listen to them. And our team of case managers who do the case coordination are, are really phenomenal because they've walked the walk. They're veterans, they're caregivers, they've had their own journey as they've transitioned out of the military. And so they know how difficult it can be. And now they're experts at finding those resources. Mm -hmm. So I think a huge part of what we do is we sit there and actually listen to someone. Instead of trying to rush them off the phone and say, call this organization, call that organization, we say, okay, what's going on, mm -hmm. right? So you peel back that onion during the first couple conversations and you recognize that if someone's having a financial crisis, there's usually something behind that, right? Mm -hmm. You were in the military a couple of years ago, you were doing okay, and now you're homeless, something happened, yeah. right? So those things need to be addressed, whether it is mental health, family unrest, transportation, legal, benefits, employment, all of those things that make up someone's quality of life. And of course, there is no one organization that does all that, mm -hmm. right? And as, again, expecting someone in crisis to try to navigate through that is unreasonable. So we've become that one point of contact mm -hmm instead of the veteran or the family member having to know where to go, you just call us, right? And we will help get you connected to the resources that you need. As part of that journey, as I was watching my team, since we work nationally across the country, 
I noticed it was taking them sometimes half of their week just to identify the resources because there are thousands of them. And each resource has a different eligibility criteria, right? So it's not like you can just take any resource and then apply it to any veteran, right? You, you gotta really match those things up. So that's what really drove the development of Patriot Link. And Patriot Link is the technology platform that we've built that helps people navigate through the system. It is free. Y'all can go on it right now, patriotlink.org. You can look for things like scholarships for your kid, equine therapy, help with employment, help with benefits. I mean, we've got, we've taken five years to populate this thing, vet and verify all the programs, keep it updated, opportunities for you all using it to give us feedback on it. So we built this because we knew that even if we added a ton more case managers, the space itself needed a system by which anybody could, could find the door. Right. So other organizations are using it. The VA is using it. So instead of when you call an organization and they say, sorry, we can't help you because you don't qualify, whatever it is, let me look at Patriot Link. Here are the three organizations that will help you. And then you get those folks connected. So we're really using both people and technology to be able to make make the connections for folks. That's amazing. Christy, that's amazing. You know, I know when I was in crisis during my trials, during my moral injury, I didn't have those kinds of links. I was, I was, I was you know, trying to figure things out. I was trying to make sense. I was going through the trauma. I was going through the pain. And it was everything that I could to be able to hold on and to, 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 to get through to the next day and to be able to know there's a resource like yours, code of support that is out there that is already making those links. And you can contact one of your case managers that will be specifically assigned to you, right, to work your case. And then you go to Patriot Link, which gives you all those resources. My, that, I mean, it's, that, that's a lifesaver. Do you have, um, could you give us some examples of the lives that you have changed at uh, Code of Support Foundation, as a CASA? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think now as we're turning 10 this year, yeah. I think back to our first client, his name is Zach, a Marine, young Marine who had done a couple deployments, had two young daughters, beautiful wife, and, uh, and we were just starting out and, and I got, somehow he called us, he was doing one of those things where he was just blasting organizations um, and trying to find some help. and. And Zach didn't even know what he needed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the case for a lot of veterans in crisis. So I would spend, I was our first case manager, right? When it was just me and Alan. And uh, spent hours on the phone with Zach to, you know, kind of walk him through like, okay, take some deep breaths. Don't try to take everything on at once. Let's do this. And then we're gonna do this. And then we're gonna do this. So again, I think Zach would even tell you 10 years later, he's doing great. His, his kids are beautiful. He's working, he's, you know, gotten, he's still getting, help that he needs around um, some of the moral injuries. But, uh, you know, I think that that looking at, you know, nine, 10 years ago, we worked, for Zach, we worked with Zach and now where he is, a lot of that was just the journey that, that we took with him, mm -hmm. right? And, and now we're doing that on a daily basis. I mean, we've got things that we help Vietnam veterans, these Vietnam veterans who came back and didn't get any help somehow managed to struggle through life, many of whom have substance abuse issues that they were able to just kind of work while they, and then once they retire, everything comes crashing down. So any Vietnam veterans who are listening, first of all, welcome home mm -hmm. and, and thank you. Um, but we know that a lot of that generation totally fell through the cracks. So what we try to do with our Vietnam veterans is get them re-engaged because many of them don't have a great relationship with the VA. Mm -hmm. And the VA certainly has its challenges, but they also by far have the most capacity. Mm -hmm. So part of our process is working with our Vietnam veterans and saying, okay, we're gonna help you make sure that you're in a stable house. We're gonna make sure that you have food. We're gonna take all care of those kind of immediate things. And then let's start talking about, you know, getting healthcare from the VA or getting benefits. So we have a, we have a couple of Vietnam veterans right now that we're working with. Mm -hmm. And then we also work with a lot of caregivers. Right, so again, as I said, people don't really know the impact of war on families. Mm -hmm. And so while of course we're helping the veterans, but the, these caregivers and the kids who are also serving as caregivers are struggling, right? And so we're able to, we have a, we have a case that we recently worked where, I mean, it, I think we provided six or seven different resources to cover down on this family and half of them were for the caregiver and the children. 
Okay, because the because the impact of just from living with a veteran with PTS and traumatic brain injury and all of that, they didn't even know that they had the right to recourse. Mm -hmm. All right. So, I mean, we, we it's hard to kind of describe and like the, the individual cases because we have so many of them. But I think the important thing is that we don't just it's not like we're just going to pay the rent. Right. We need to figure out why you need to get your rent paid, what happened, financial coach, financial counselor, get the rent paid, what's the next step, what's the job, what's the benefits, all that stuff. Because just you know, stopping the bleeding doesn't get you to where you need to go. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important to engage all these other organizations, like some of the retreat organizations, continuing service organizations, right? all of those things. Mm -hmm. But you can't get people to focus on anything until they have a roof over their head their kids have food, so you have to take care of those immediate things first. And then you walk with them through the rest of the journey of, okay, now let's start talking about what job opportunities you might be able to take on or what benefits or whatever it is and what kind of peer support you need. You want to, you know, if you've served in the military, you are wired to serve. That doesn't stop when you take off the uniform. It's like what you're doing, Charlie. You're continuing to serve the community. So most of the folks we work with want to do that. And there are some really fantastic organizations that that do that. Team Red, White, and Blue, mm -hmm. Team Rubicon, um, you know, uh, 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 Mission uh, Continues. There's some wonderful organizations out there. So then that's like once we get them to the stable, we take them to that next level. So yeah. it's really a journey for us. That's incredible, <clears throat> Christy. It's really just I, 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 such a such a blessing to the community to what you guys have both put together and, and to uh, imagine that you guys are 10 years old now. Did you imagine when you first started this together, Alan and Christy, that it would be what it is today? No. <laughs> no, it <laughs> <laughs> Very simple, that was an easy question to answer. <laughs> well, um, let me ask this then. Um, what has What has been one of your greatest triumphs at Code of Support over the past 10 years? Um, I'll take a crack on that. And uh, the, I think it was, uh, for me, probably when uh, we started getting uh, the attention of four stars, frankly, uh, and, it, the, and uh, Four star wives mm -hmm. are another very important, uh, I should say, spouses. Uh, but uh, one of the biggest difficulties we had as a new kid on the block was just gaining acceptance, credibility. Uh, and that's why I reached out to a lot of people that I did have uh, contact with or knew at one level or another. Uh, some very, very high uh, profile Americans and asked them to be on our advisory board. Mm -hmm. uh, and th that, that helped us uh, with the credibility issue. So uh, getting recognized for the kind of thing you can do is not easy, uh, but w when you do get that recognition and acceptance and we have four stars uh, willing to come and uh, address a, a meeting that we're having, uh, that that was uh, very, very significant to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I want to make sure that there is uh, one impression that uh, gets made correctly here. Um, we talked about Christie's role uh, in writing the op-ed and things like that. Uh, let no one think that uh, we are critical of the services directly. Oh, no. We know that their hearts are in the right places, they're trying to do the right thing. Uh, they are bureaucracies, let's face it. Uh, and sometimes they need a little help in what this direction or another, and those of us on the outside are better positioned to give that nudge than those uh, that are on the inside. Christy was on the inside uh, at the time, uh, but as a spouse she did have a little degree of freedom. The same thing with the VA, by the way. Uh, we have a partnership with the VA. We work with them uh, probably on a daily basis, uh, and we love the VA. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we help them to do their job right. <laughs> I'll say that that way. And, and some of the clients that we have uh, just are falling into a crack uh, that is broken down in bureaucracy, and when that is an urgent situation, 
we can move that ball forward. And the VA really is very thankful for us for working with them on things like that. Yeah, I would say that the, um, you know, this whole narrative that I think sometimes dominates the veteran community around like the VA stinks isn't helpful because it's not true. Yeah, now, not true. again, <laughs> everybody's had their experiences and some local VAs are working better than others, but Alan's right, it is an institution of bureaucracy. It's about getting your relationships and working with folks and, you know, VA is very different than DOD. It's very decentralized. Like. Mm -hmm. When, when I met, you know, early on uh, with General Corelli, who was the vice at the time, he was working a lot around suicide, and, you know, when he, if he put an Alcon order out, the next day, whatever happening stopped or started. That was it. It just happened that way. That is not the way it works in the VA. So I think that's one of the challenges. And, and Al is, is way too classy and too much of a gentleman to, to, to say that, you um, yeah, I was getting attention from the four stars and the four stars wise before we started going to support, but probably not for, not for the best of not reasons. Not for the best of reasons, right? <laughs> uh, but he's right in that sometimes you do need to, I remember talking to uh, a general's wife at Fort Bragg, just a lovely woman, and you know, she was supportive of the op-ed, and I was pushing, pushing, pushing down an insulation angle, and you know, she said, you know, Christy, you really need to uh, stay within your chain of command. And I remember saying to her, ma'am, due respect, I'm a civilian. I don't have a chain of command. And if my husband's chain of command is broken, like, I, I'm going to keep going, mm -hmm. right? You know, I, I can't, it was, and it, it, it makes me sound like much more of a maverick than I am. But it's just kind of like, if you see, like, people were dying on the home front, suicides, children. I mean, it was bad, Charlie. It was really bad. And so I, I was like, okay, well, I understand how things are done and I understand protocol, but sometimes you just kind of have to push, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the great things about being a nonprofit is you have a little bit more leeway. And we know the people that run the VA and DOD, and they're great. They're really good. And, you know, you have to take these different strengths of the different sectors the branches, the VA, the nonprofits, the faith-based, the business community, you can't expect them to be something that they're not. So you just have to kind of figure out a way to, to work it all together. And, and that's kind of what we do. You know, we, we just figure things out. If, if someone made me ask me, like, what do you do for the support? We figure it out. Mm -hmm. Just figure it out. Well, and, and you're right. You know, I think nonprofits are in a position to be able to do some things that the institutional bureaucracies we can't do it just because of the way they're structured. So we fill in that void or we try to fill in that void to help to offset some of those things that are not, that they just can't do. We can do. And, you know, we try to focus, uh, the military is, I, I love it. I mean, 70% of the people that are in the military are fine. We're looking at the 30%. And well, if you look at 20 million people, like 20 million are, uh, in our country are veterans. Now that's about three million pits, a lot of people that are that are hurting. And so we want to be able to give them those tools and resources. And I think the nonprofits can do that, but because there's so many, it, it gets lost in the shuffle. And that's why I love, has, you know, in your 10 years, what you have been able to do is to overcome so many challenges that so many other nonprofits or organizations faced. Has that been one of your greatest challenges that you faced in the past 10 years? Uh, or was there something else, and, and, and how did you overcome it? I, I think the greatest, greatest challenge for me personally uh, was to kind of move from this, you know, this reputation as kind of an outside-the-bounds military wife to the CEO of a national nonprofit, right? So the, the things that, that, some of the things that got us here were the fact that I lean pretty far forward and, and Alan helps me do that. And, you know, but also I think that I had to shift from, you know, that reputation to, okay, this is a serious national organization that is really transforming access to care with people and technology. So for me, that's been a journey. And, you know, when you kind of, you start a nonprofit, and Alan and I are both pretty, you know, idealistic and we want to help and we want to do great things. And, you have no idea what you're getting yourself into in terms of how to build a business and to make it scalable. So for me, I think that's been one of the biggest challenges and the biggest rewards is figuring out how to do that. Mm -hmm. 
What about you, Alan? What has been the most enjoyable thing in these last 10 years or that you've had to overcome? Um, well, the, the most enjoyable thing is, is maybe a, a little bit different than, than having to overcome. But, um, you know, Charlie, I, I've had 20 or 30 years in the Army, 12 years in industry, and uh, I'm very proud of, of the accomplishments that, that I had at, both in the military and in industry. This, without a doubt, is the most important work that I have done. Mm -hmm. uh, I've said that before and I'll say it again many times because it's, it's true. Uh, and when you can actually meet some of these people who have been on the other end of the phone for our case coordinators uh, for six, seven months working through things, and you meet the family face to face at some opportunity and you see how they're thriving, mm -hmm. there's no replacing that yeah. uh, as, uh, as reward, psychic reward for what you're doing. And you're seeing the living impact of that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add to uh, what, what Christy said, uh, was saying a few minutes ago about some of the role here. Uh, and I, I'm thinking of, you know, Patriot Link takes this world of support organizations and narrows it down into 20 basic categories, and Christy has mentioned most of them, you know, financial support, mental health, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's subcategories within all of those. Many times, and Christy will, can give you some great examples, I'm sure, but when our case coordinators are working through and doing an assessment of what this family needs, there's a lot of things that don't fit into any of those 20 boxes. Mm -hmm. And that's where Christy says, You've got to, we figure it out. And, and I, I've said, you know, I'm an engineering guy in, in uh, my professional life, and, and these are solution engineers. So much of what we do is figuring out the things that fall through the cracks. Uh, and you, know, you can't put a price on that in terms of being able to come up with a solution. So it's easy to say, that's not in our mission statement. We don't do that, try somebody else or on the other hand, you can say, well, we've never had that situation before. Let's figure out how we can, can make that happen. And we have some wonderful partner organizations that help us make that happen. If we have to buy a septic tank for somebody who's trying to move into a home they've built themselves, and that's a real life situation, we have people we can go to, organizations or individuals, and they will fund it. That's like, amazing. I mean, we're miracle workers, and, and that's yeah. the culture that Christie really has has built yeah. uh, into this organization. That's so important. That's Figure amazing. Figure it out, get it done. That's amazing, amazing, and that's very much. I mean, that's that's so uh, comforting. That's got to be so comforting, and the, and you feel like people actually care. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest things. People actually are caring about our, my me and my family. And I know there's a video on your website with Jason on there. Uh, there was a small, and what a beautiful story that is. I highly recommend uh, people when you go to their website, uh, codeofsupport.org, uh, go check out that that video. It's about three minutes long. It's beautiful, and it just yeah, really the, reflects know, the, that. Go ahead. Yeah, Charlie. The the I want to leave people with a couple things. Number one, you are not alone, even if you might feel that way. I know there are people out there listening, feeling like there's there's no one out there for you. No one cares. It is not true. Mm -hmm. We had a client a couple of years ago who was really struggling with his mental health, and um, and we actually got him to the VA hospital to the emergency room, and he was sitting in his car and didn't want to go. So we put out on Facebook, hey, you know, we've got a, a combat uh, marine who really is struggling to walk in that door. Give him some encouragement. Within a half hour, we had a hundred messages, and we were texting the messages to him from Americans to say, please go in, we love you, thank you, you know, so it's even though it feels like you might be on your own, you're not, mm -hmm. and if you need help, please reach out to us at codasupport.org, please go on to patriotlink.org, this is all free, um, and find the resources that you need, and if you are in a position to help um, fund us. We're doing something this year that's really cool for our 10th year anniversary. It's called 10 for 10. Mm -hmm. So you can sign up for $10 a month to celebrate our 10 years. And you know, for a couple of uh, price of a couple of, uh, cups of coffee a month, you could actually be helping us save lives. And so this work 
even though it's free to veterans and everybody that uses it does not come free. So any anybody out there that's listening that can make a donation to Coda Support Foundation, please consider that because we need the help so we can help more folks. Yeah. And I love that you brought up that 10 for 10 campaign. I, you know, I, th I think it's brilliant. It's an easy way for people to participate, and you are doing the work that's really helping uh, the veterans, the caregivers, the families, uh, and it's just it's a wonderful way to be able to help serve uh, others in a way that, uh, you know, it's very easy to do. Uh, and we spent some time reflecting on the past 10 years. What's your guys' vision for the next 10 years for Code of Support? I think we have the opportunity to really transform the way people get access to care because we have this technology platform. Technology is part of the solution. It facilitates human relationships. We're not saying that the tech is going to change the game, but it's the connector that will help the game change, mm -hmm. right? So I think that the fact that we have these numbers around suicides that aren't going down. You know, we have a lot of other negative numbers that we're seeing with the amount of effort and money spent, we should be seeing better outcomes. So we think that if we're able to get a mass adoption of Patriot Link, providers across the country using it, veterans, family members, it really will lead to, okay, we have all these hundreds of billions of dollars worth of resources, now we're actually getting the people who need them connected. Mm -hmm. So the goal for us really is to, to make that happen, to get Patriot Link upstream into the transition process. Mm -hmm. When you get out of the military, everybody knows that you go through TAP. Imagine if you could download this, uh, this uh, app on your phone and then all of a sudden you, are, you, know, you have that in your pocket whenever you need it. Mm -hmm. So that's our goal, to, to kind of change the way people get help. That would be life saving. Life changing. What I'd add to that, Charlie, is uh, on the other side of the coin as well, uh, and that's our case coordination uh, business. Uh, it's it's a proven process. It, it's an extremely well detailed process because we need that as we train a new case coordinator. Uh, and now we're helping on the order of a thousand or so family members a year. We should be helping ten times that if not another factor of 10. Uh, and I'd like to see us scale that. We, we are about to, to uh, take on the role, self-appointed, uh, as the National Case Coordination Center. Wow. Uh, what that means to us is that we want to give America, America's veterans one point of contact that will take care of your problems. Uh, now, there are a number of organizations in, in hot spots around the country that have a, something similar to our case coordination process on a very localized basis. When we get a case coming into us that is in their territory, we do a warm handoff. We have relationships with all of those. So basically, we, we're establishing the National Case Coordination Network, and we are the National Case Coordination Center. That's all part of this scaling to be all we can be. That's amazing. Um, do you have any events that are coming up, uh, and how can concerned citizens get involved with Code of Support Foundation? Yeah, we've got a few really cool events coming up. Uh, right now we have something called Archer's Challenge going on, so for those of you who like to exercise, you can go to our website and sign up for Archer's Challenge. It's 100 miles in, in a month, and you can do it by walking, Orange Theory, whatever, we, uh, and, and uh, you can do peer fundraising. So you'd be raising money for COVID support and getting exercise at the same time. So that's Archer's Challenge. We also have Toast to Our Troops coming up. That's going to be virtual, so you all can join for free. That's October 7th. Uh, so any of you guys that have uh, potential um, corporations that want to sponsor, that's another way to get engaged. And then we actually have a really cool thing on our website called 99 Ways um, to Serve. And if you all go there, you can, uh, you can check out... Um, you know, interest areas, like if you like dogs, if you're into, you know, law, you can look up those things, find organizations that are doing that, and uh, potentially volunteer with them. So we're really trying to kind of spread the wealth and make sure that people know about the opportunities to serve either with Code of Support as a volunteer um, and or in their communities and other organizations. Fantastic. Uh, again, folks, that is codeofsupport.org. That's www.codeofsupport.org. Uh, we are at the end of the show today, folks. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Before we close, I want to do a quick shout-out to our station here, KUHS Radio TV Denver. We are broadcasting live here 
in Denver, Colorado, uh, broadcasting all across the nation, all around the world. Thank you, Henry, and everybody in the back uh, that makes all this magic happen, make it easy for all of us to be able to enjoy. Couldn't do it without you. Um, thank you, Alan and Christy, for being on the show with me today. And it's just a privilege. You are always welcome on the council. Uh, would love to be able to continue to have this dialogue with, uh, with you as we, uh, as we share these resources out to the, to the wider world and to our veterans and the veteran community. Um, before I, I close off, I always ask my guests a very simple question, uh, and I would love for both of you to answer that before we close. Um, Christy and Alan, uh, if you could give one piece of advice, one bit of wisdom from your life experience, what would it be? I'll start. Uh, I go back to the uh, spinoff of the Golden Rule that it's more blessed to, to give than receive. And, and give is not just treasure, it can be time. And time is our most precious commodity that anybody has. It's also more fun uh, and re much more rewarding to, be, to share your talent, your treasure and whatnot uh, with other people. There's just nothing uh, that, that can take its place. I, yes, sir, I agree. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, my little piece of wisdom would be perspective. Um, don't let what you're feeling in the very moment um, inform your entire life view. We've all had a rough couple of years with this yeah. pandemic, and I know that, like for me, it's been a real lesson in perspective. So I think those of us um, who struggle sometimes, and we all do, that that you know when you are feeling down, that's not who you are. It's just where you are at that minute. Try to keep some perspective. Amen to that. We all need to do that. And thank you folks so much for tuning in today to the council. It is an honor and a privilege to be your host. We have another great guest coming up next week and, uh, and then all of August. So please tune in. The council is adjourned. May you all be well. May you all be free of pain and suffering. May you all be whole. God bless. We will see you next week. Peace.